Ray opens up by sending an email to the whole firm saying, there's piss on the floor. Ray went to the restroom. He stood at a urinal and he looked down and there was liquid under the urinal. He starts this multi-week investigation. He hauls in the facility staff. And he says, did you install these urinals properly? Were there the stickers to aim where you're going to urinate? There are people then posted outside the bathroom to go investigate after every single time someone uses the restroom to find out who's the culprit, or as Ray would put it, who's the root cause. The people who told me this story, some of them are laughing, but some of them are also very disturbed because it was the smallest issue you could possibly imagine, something we've all experienced, and Ray has attempted to turn it into nothing short of a referendum on the entire company. Welcome to the Work for Humans podcast. This is Dart Lindsley. Ray Dalio is a renowned American investor and the founder of Bridgewater Associates, which is one of the world's largest and most successful hedge funds. Dalio gained fame for pioneering a set of management practices focused on radical transparency and the pursuit of truth at all costs. While these ideas sound compelling, investigative reporter Rob Copeland decided to dig beneath the surface to uncover the true effects of Ray Dalio's methods. In his latest book, The Fund, Ray Dalio, Bridgewater Associates, and the Unraveling of a Wall Street Legend, Copeland argues Ray Dalio's principles are a grand display of ego that fosters a toxic work culture of paranoia and backstabbing. Rob's an award-winning investigative reporter for The New York Times. Prior to the Times, he spent nearly a decade as a financial reporter for The Wall Street Journal, covering front-page stories from across the financial industry. In this episode, Rob and I delve into the management principles at Bridgewater Associates, practices such as recording nearly every conversation, requiring employees to inform on their peers' failures, and cross-examining employees on stage at company all hands at times until they fled weeping. We also talk about the mental models underpinning Dalio's management practices, whether or not performative cruelty actually improves hedge fund success, and the ultimate mystery of why thousands of brilliant, honest professionals volunteer to be subjected to these practices, as well as other topics. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And now I bring you my conversation with Rob Copeland. Rob Copeland, welcome to Work for Humans. Thank you. I just finished reading your book, The Fund, and I just got to say, what a book. It is clearly taken a career to research it. And I think like many people reading it, one of the first questions on my mind is, who is your lawyer? And are you scared to do an expose on somebody as powerful as Ray Dalio? Well, I have more than one lawyer, so that helps. I will say I'm not scared because, not to be jingoistic, but in the United States of America, we have very strong protections for the truth. And when I say the truth, I don't mean Ray Dalio's version of the truth, which we can get into later, but I mean the actual truth of of what happened. And it's actually quite, it's quite simple to write a nonfiction book about Ray because all you have to do is is write what actually happened. The difficulty, I think, is is probably a lot harder for Ray, who has to has to keep this Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass version of himself uh, going for so many years now. For me, it's easy. Because this is a show about work, I want to get into the management principles, both as they are espoused and then also how they were practiced or are practiced. So first of all, what is Bridgewater? What was Bridgewater for people who are not familiar with it? So Bridgewater is the world's largest hedge fund. And this isn't a book about hedge funds. I'm not that naturally interested in the mechanics of hedge funds. But at their core, hedge funds are just big pools of money from rich uh, institutions or individuals. Everyone puts their money together and they attempt to essentially beat the market. They can do that by betting on or betting against virtually any asset worldwide. Set that aside. That's about as much as I'm, I'm interested in, in the finances of, of hedge funds. What Ray has become so famous for is that he takes Bridgewater, it's the world's biggest hedge fund, which made him worth $20 billion or so, and he decides that he has sort of cracked the secrets of human nature. And so for the past 20 years, Ray has been on a nonstop, both public and private effort to prove to people that he has discovered what he literally calls the, the holy grail. So there's a lot of things to take a part in there. But how would you describe what that holy grail is? 
Well, for Ray, the, the Holy Grail is twofold. One, he claims to have uh, cracked the secret to how to invest successfully. So in order for everything that we're going to talk about to persuade people, Ray first has to establish that he is the world's greatest investor. So he comes up with this, this story that he has discovered hundreds of secret investing rules that he can't tell you about, but that he calls them, quote, timeless and universal. That's why he's so rich. And having established that, he sort of embarks on this fateful uh, set of logic, which he begins to invent these things called principles. And it's really important that people realize that the principles, which is this term that has become very closely associated with Ray, is not a word that comes out of his mouth until after he's a billionaire. So it's a retro fit for his success. And the principles are a manifesto and a set of, of doctrine for how to live your life, uh, both personally and in work. And Ray says, if nothing short of, if you follow these rules, you will become rich. The story arc that I heard in reading about Ray was first, originally a terribly successful investor, but along the way, becoming more and more acquainted with people who really have money, realizing that what those people want is not shooting for the moon investments. What they want to do is they want to protect what they have and the money that they have. And so one of the most important things about being a hedge fund is not necessarily that you hack the financial system, but that you hack the psychology of the very wealthy. And so he seems to have done that very successfully, starts making a lot of money, and he started to believe that the things that had made him a successful investor, the mindset, could be applied to the people inside the organization. What were the management practices that were created? At its core, Bridgewater and Ray Dalio's management uh, doctrine really boils down to that we have two sides of our brain. We have the emotional side and we have the practical side, and that the emotional side is constantly leading us awry. So at our best, we ignore our emotions and we can simply make decisions based on logic. Now, that doesn't sound crazy. I think most people have gone through moments in their life when they felt sort of that rush of heat inside them and they have maybe made a decision that a day or a week or a year later, they, they wish they hadn't. But what Ray does is he takes this very sort of anodyne observation and he infuses it with, with steroids. He comes up with these hundreds of principles. And probably his, his favorite one is pain plus reflection equals progress. So if we go through a painful moment in your life, if you could take a, a beat, reflect on it, you'll find some progress there. The one that he probably talks about the most, the real fun part and the wild part and the dystopian part is exactly how Ray Dalio makes sure that he can inflict that pain on you so that you can find you know, so-called progress. I'm not sure which concept to go after first, but I want to go after the mechanics. It's kind of a life cycle from dot collection through, and we'll talk about what dots are and believability, through interrogation or probing, and in many cases, breaking, and then decision. So what are dots and how are they collected? As part of this ever-expanding sort of personality-based tools that, that Ray comes up with over the past two decades, Maybe the most important one are these dots. And dots are individual pieces of feedback that anyone at the firm is not just can, but is required to provide to other people. And it's a dot is a rating. It means that I would be rating you, Dart, right now during this conversation on a one to 10 scale on any number of personality attributes. This could be something sort of logical, like ability to listen. And then it could be something completely undefinable, such as ability to push through to find the truth. So right now, I would be required to be rating you one to 10, giving you a dot in which I would say, Dart, you're a seven on pushing through to find the truth. And what's really important to understand about dots is that these are not private. These are public. So I can also see how other people have rated you. I can see your average in all of these, in these categories. So going into the meeting, I already have an impression of how good or bad you are at these various impenetrable categories. What were some of the mandates around collecting dots about your peers? Well, first of all, you were required to dot a certain number every day. So you couldn't walk through your day and just say, I don't have any opinions. You were also required to have a certain number of negative dots. So you couldn't just be a nice person. You were required additionally, not just to dot people who you interacted with every day, but 
sort of people on all sides of the firm. You were required to dot the CEO and the CEO was required to, to dot you. And, and we can get into this in a bit, but Bridgewater has various you know, recording techniques that have made it very easy to dot people who you might not even have met ever. So there's just sort of this fuselage of data coming in. I mean, I think everyone understands probably about age eight, you know, garbage in, garbage out is what they tell you about using a calculator in math class. Just because you're using a calculator doesn't mean you're going to get to the right answer. Just because you're dotting people all day doesn't mean that you've come up with anything. Let's talk about the recording practices. What were those? Ray is probably most famous at this point for this term, radical transparency. He talks about it nearly constantly. He talks about it in his TED Talks, YouTube videos, interviews at every conceivable television station. And radical transparency at Bridgewater means that everything is taped and recorded and visible to everyone inside the firm. So this interview, for instance, if no one were listening to it or watching it, we would have already hit record and it would be uploaded to what Bridgewater calls its transparency library, which is a term that is, if I made it up, you say it's too thick, it's too, uh, too Orwellian. That means that inside this transparency library, there are tens of thousands of videos of the major and minor goings on at Bridgewater. At any po- moment, I can pull up a recording of your conversation with someone else a day, a week, a year ago, and I can begin to criticize it. I can also pull it up in the middle of a conversation and say, hey, you told this other person this six months ago. Why are you saying this this now? It's important to realize that the transparency library did not just apply to meetings where we talked about business. It could apply to just conversations we had about our personal life. It could apply to uh, complaints that we might have about the cafeteria food, about the bus driver, about the cleanliness of the bathrooms. It really is a, a superhuman surveillance ecosystem in which there's virtually no privacy inside the firm. What was the concept of believability? This is one of my favorite terms that, uh, that I've ever heard, which is that, that Ray becomes obsessed with the idea that just because everyone is rating one another doesn't mean that their votes should all be counted equally. And again, maybe on its face, this doesn't sound insane. Maybe the believability of your doctor, for instance, maybe your doctor should be more believable than you in how to treat your cancer. But what Ray decides is that every single one of those attributes that we're dating one, uh, dotting one another on should also have its own believability metric, which means that I, for instance, if I myself was not rated well at, say, pushing through to the truth, that when I dotted you in that same category, that my vote, my rating would not carry much weight. And race talks about this as if it is the ultimate meritocracy. But of course, the truth is, I think you could guess where the truth is going here, is that Ray rigs the system to make sure that it's Ray's vote which carries the most weight, which means that if you ever try to tell the truth to Ray in any of these important categories, it's like throwing spaghetti against the wall. It's just not going to stick. It's like bringing a gun to a knife fight. How many metaphors do you want me to use here? <laughs> it really becomes a system which has almost nothing to do with science and everything to do with fiction. This is, did these dots matter? And the reason I want to get into that is because I want to know what behaviors they incent. So how are these dots used? Let's follow the path of dots through action. What most commonly happened at Bridgewater is that Ray would find a reason to sort of what he calls probe or diagnose you for a mistake. So the most common use of dots isn't necessarily me and you one-on-one, but that there would be a, literally a trial at Bridgewater over an error that someone had made. And then everyone would file in either tens or dozens or even hundreds of people, and they would watch Ray Dalio make, make an example of you. That's embarrassing enough as it is. You know, it's embarrassing enough to have your, your boss sort of exploiting you in front of all these, these people. But what would be happening is at the very same time, all of these people around would also be rating you in all those personality categories. So you would walk out of this trial, which is ostensibly to help you learn how to be a better person and do your job better. And you would be confronted with the fact that all these hundreds of people have just filled you, your, your ratings with all these negative red dots. It's a complete pile on. Now, remember, something very important that I said a few minutes ago, which is that your dots are visible to everyone. So that means that the next meeting you go into, you are no longer considered believable because all of these hundreds of people have just piled on and just told you that you're terrible. That sort of can put you into a spiral and a hole from which there really is no way to to climb out. This method permanently damaged people. Actually, before we go into that, I would just want to call out a note to anybody who's designing performance systems, who's in my listeners, which is, that this is the logical extreme of many performance systems. But there's some key things in the middle of it that I think are particularly 
uh, telling. One is this essentialist idea, which is I'm not judging you on your outcomes. I'm judging you on who you are when I do a dot. And so you would go into one of these probing events and you'd come out essentially being displayed as a different person fundamentally in terms of how you think. People tried to turn this into like a system, like a software, and they ran into challenges doing that, which is terrifying, I have to admit. Why did it not work as a system, as software? That's a complicated, a huge topic, which is that Ray begins to be obsessed with the idea that this system could be dynamic, that our ratings could instantly affect other people's ratings. And even more than that, that we could use software to predict what your rating might be before it even happens. Because remember, uh, if we have all this data, uh, we should be able to sort of just see a correlation. If you're good at this, you're bad at this, et cetera. And the system might even be able to assign you into the right job or to, as Ray, as Bridgewater puts it, to sort you out of your job, which is their term for firing you. Now, there's a thousand reasons why this can't work and didn't work. But I want to be clear that Ray pours hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to make this work. He hires the famed IBM computer scientist, David Ferrucci, who's credited with inventing Watson, which beat a human contestant at Jeopardy. The problem with this system is it's not a meritocracy. If everyone's vote counts differently, which it does, and if Ray Dalio, the firm founders, waits most of all, then at any moment, the whole house of cards can go tumbling down just by Ray changing his opinion of you. Another reason why it doesn't work is that these categories, which seem to judge, as you say, something essential about yourself, are completely undefinable. One of Ray's principles in one of the categories is taste the soup. This means essentially that you should get involved in the decision making and not just rely on other people. Well, how the heck do I judge you numerically on that? And what does my number mean versus your judgment of someone else at tasting the soup? It's a, well, it's a, it's a mess. It's a soup. But it's as we get into dozens and dozens of categories and as Ray begins inventing new ones and eliminating other ones, I can just tell you that hundreds of advanced scientists came in, tried to figure out, make heads or tails of this, and it doesn't work. Well, it does work in one, in one respect, I apologize, which is it very effectively reminds people constantly that Ray Dalio is the best at everything and that you couldn't possibly equal him. Yes, by definition, best at everything. And also that you're constantly being watched. And so you and I both actually interviewed at uh, Bridgewater at different times in our careers. And I had experiences with people there, which I now have to think back on and realize that everything that they said to me, they were saying in the light of being recorded. It wasn't a secret that everybody was being recorded. There were tape recorders and we'd push the button before the interview. And so it wasn't a secret, it was wide open. But now if I'm a, a person inside the company and I'm trying to survive in this dot system, sort of game theoretically, how do I start to behave? Well, you behave like you're being watched because you are. So instead of giving someone the rating that you might actually believe in your heart, you all of a sudden have to think about the fact that they're going to see this rating and everyone else is going to see the rate. So there's very little incentive to cross what the majority view is at any point, because then you might be seen as, hey, Dart, why did you rate Rob so highly in tasting the soup? That guy sucks at tasting the soup. And I can see it right there in his ratings. So then people will start piling on on you. The other logical not just end point, but frankly, start point of all of this, there's a limited number of actual problems at any enterprise. Most mistakes that we make at our jobs in our life, in my opinion, don't actually say something fundamental about our personality. I think it's possible to make a mistake. There are degrees of mistakes. But at Bridgewater, it's literally in the principles that there, there are no such thing as small mistakes, that everything is a referendum on the person who did it. So what happens is people begin to investigate and to rate their employees for increasingly small issues, because there's a prize there for being the person who says, hey, I identified something new here. I identified that you, you made this mistake or this, this error, or this is part of a, a personality flaw of yours. And it rolls downhill very quickly and then keeps, keeps rolling, frankly, for the 15 year period that this book takes place. What is a strong manager in this context? Ray would say, you're not a strong manager. If somebody in your team gets down dotted heavily for something is the source of an error, you as their manager in the book, I think the phrase was, well, you're not a strong manager. And one of the lines was, I don't need you to be a weak manager. I need you to be a motherfucker. Correct. And I heard about that before the book. And I think 
In fact, the reason I heard about it was because somebody who'd been interviewed there was shown that recording as this is the right kind of behavior. <laughs> because people who interviewed there were sometimes shown recordings of events. There's a great irony, which is that it's true at Bridgewater and under the principles, and your error reflects poorly, maybe even doubly on your manager, because they'll say you were managing this employee poorly. The ultimate manager of everyone was Ray Dalio. So given that there was a near con constant tumult inside this firm, the logical endpoint should have been an investigation of Ray for his poor management of everyone. But of course, spoiler alert, that couldn't possibly happen at, at Bridgewater. The paradigm of a good manager at Bridgewater, frankly, is someone who is always finding errors, who's always finding mistakes. So ironically, a manager who hires only the highest performing people is actually going to be rated poorly because they won't find enough mistakes. So what they have to do is continue to go down market, so to speak, and to find smaller and smaller errors right up to the point where, you know, one woman in the book is, is investigated elaborately multiple times by Ray himself for not bringing in bagels on the morning when she said she would bring in bagels. And it's easy to laugh at this, but this is a real life woman. She's, she's still, uh, she's an attorney. She's at a major firm now. This actually happened. What is the smallest infraction that became a, a sort of a, a case that took hundreds of hours of examination? One of the smallest, I would say for me, is there's a case that Ray, Ray opens up by sending a, an email to the whole firm saying there's piss on the floor. And what has happened is Ray went to the restroom. He stood at a urinal. This has happened to me before. It's probably happened to you. And he looked down and there was liquid under the urinal. And it's not a memorable moment to anyone who's ever gone to, you know, the old LaGuardia airport. But for Ray, it, it was. And he starts this multi-week investigation of what has happened at this urinal. And he hauls in the facility staff. And he says, did you install these urinals properly? Were there the stickers to aim where you're going to urinate? Where, have you been cleaning them properly? There are people then posted outside the bathroom to go investigate after every single time someone uses the restroom to find out who's the, who's the culprit, or as Ray would put it, who's the root cause. And to me, this is the perfect example because despite weeks of an investigation, no one at Bridgewater, this paradigm of radical transparency, no one has the cojones to just say to Ray, Ray, is it possible you missed? Is it possible you're the origin of the liquid under the, under the urinal? And the people who told, told me this story, many of them did. You know, some of them are laughing, but some of them are also very disturbed because it was the smallest issue you could possibly imagine, something we've all experienced on Earth that we all do several times a day. And Ray has attempted to turn it into nothing short of a referendum on the entire company. I want to get into some of the, the mental models underlying this. And the reason I want to do that is because I think many of us are guilty of them and that many of the management systems that we design, not that Ray designed, but it, that all of us design, are based upon some of these ideas. And so one of them is that it's possible to hack, understand the mechanistic principles of a complex system made of humans. And I'm going to list a couple of them, and you can tell me if maybe one of them's wrong, or maybe you can say, no, there's another one. <laughs> another one is of Ray's is that making money is the same thing as intelligence. And so one thing he would say to people is, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? As if making money and intelligence are identical. I think there's a, an essentialist belief there that the attributes of people are fixed and knowable. And then there's the idea that if you scare the crap out of everybody, you'll get more truth. Recently, I had Jerry Toner on the show who spoke about the norms of slavery. And one of those was that slaves, if they're going to testify in court in ancient Rome, needed to be tortured. And the reason was Slaves always lie. Everybody knows that. And so you have to torture them if you want to get the truth. So there's this idea that you get more truth by inflicting pain. Well, pain plus reflection equals progress. Exactly. So there's all these things underlying it. Are there more beliefs? And that also might be shared that you recognized as being shared by other authoritarians. By the way, I would respectfully disagree with you on one thing, which, well, it'll be respectful, so it's not very Ray Dalio. I don't believe that his argument would be that being rich makes the, the, the exact um, correlation there between being wealthy and successful. He would say, I am rich, so I must be right. The richness is the evidence for why he must be right about everything. There is a lot inside Bridgewater that is shared by other personality-based organizations, by other companies like Netflix, you know, which has a very strong doctrine. And to me, it, it comes down to this idea that 
disagreeing with one another forthrightly and having this open conversation is something that could ever be done on an equal playing field. Is that I could disagree with you and you could disagree with me and it would come to we would come to the better conclusion. In my study, and I studied a lot of these organizations, you know, while doing these, this book, you will find that these organizations inevitably always ends with the firm founder proving to you that he's right. And of course, what you've just done is basically given up in the end. A true meritocracy, I suppose, would have to involve no money altogether. One of you couldn't be paying the other. There's a wonderful light at the end of the tunnel for people at Bridgewater that is true in a lot of places, which is if you can put up with this, you have not just a financial bounty, but you have a chance to be a higher level version of yourself. And I think if you talk to people in, you know, even in, in communist China, there's a sort of collectivist idea that like, if I can put up with this, we will all be better off with it for it in the end. I have to put myself, my personal pain aside. There's an organization called uh, Nexium that or was in upstate New York. And there's a this documentary about them. And there's a young woman who is locked in a room for two years by her parents and by the, the founder of this organization. And it's for her own good. She needs to be punished. She needs to be to learn her lessons. And I'll spoil the end of one of their episodes, which is that the door was never locked. She could have left at any time. So there's something that keeps us in these organizations that isn't simply the paycheck or anything else. We don't want to leave. That's a, a really, really important question. And I think some of the humiliations that people underwent and stayed were really shocking to me. And the people at Bridgewater, in my experience, are super smart, talented, capable people, and yet stayed. And I agree with your, your hypothesis that a, or your diagnosis, I guess, can't use the word diagnosis in this context because of how Ray used it, but that people stayed in part because there was an opportunity for self-improvement. I remember looking at it. I withdrew before offer. And the reason I withdrew before offer was because I looked into the company. I was very attracted to it. I was attracted to this idea of this is a place where ideas are really tested. This is an, a place of open discussion. Ideas are tested rigorously and everybody gets smarter. And that was so attractive. On the other hand, the analogy for me is one time I was about to go boogie boarding in a, a beach I'd never been to. And I got all the way down to the water and the, it was a big day. So it was exciting. I like, oh, I wonder if I can, you know, if this is going to work for me. And I looked out at the ocean and the waves were falling in slow motion. And I was like, why is that? And it's because they were farther away than I thought. And they were way bigger than I thought because I couldn't judge the distance. And so I did not go into the ocean that day. There are many reasons why you turn down a job. But one of the main reasons was I was scared of it. I had that same feeling of, this could be a deadly place. Where I'm going with that is I understand the attraction. And I also understand that once you're out in the surf, sometimes you're in the surf and there, you can't get out, that there are challenges to getting out. Part of the attraction was money. And so I'm curious, how motivated were people to stay because of the money, in your opinion? And how motivated were people to stay because of the growth? I know that's an impossible question. No, but, th but they're connected because. The money helps you at the, at the very start. You know, that's what gets you to ignore your instincts and your values. In fact, Bridgewater and the principals tell you to do that. They tell you, you will have to adopt our values and it's going to be uncomfortable. And so they, they simply must, and they do offer people a ton of money at the start. They do something else that, that I think won't surprise you because you were interviewing when you were an experienced hire. They overwhelmingly hire new college grads. I actually just met someone just last week who had left relatively recently. He just ran into me at a, a social event and he was so thrilled to meet me. It was kind of funny. He'd been there for 10 years and he joined straight out of uh, an Ivy League school. And he was like, oh, it didn't even seem that strange to me. And I said, well, of course it didn't seem that strange to you. You had no angle on it. You had no way of knowing that it was that strange. And they do this over and over and over again. It's part of the reason why the people who still lead Bridgewater overwhelmingly are people who joined out of college who just have no real sense of, of perspective. But I want to be clear that Ray has a lot of help in this, and it's not just people at Bridgewater. Ray is able to point to famous psychologists, big name organizations who endorse his approach. So if it's not working for you, you're not merely saying, Ray, you're wrong, but you're saying, you know, Adam Grant, the, uh, the famed Wharton psychologist, you'd have to be saying, Adam, you're wrong. You'd have to be saying, uh, Bill Gates, you're wrong. Ray, 
He did a talk at Google. Now you're saying Google's wrong. He has such an advantage over you, the individual, even though it may seem that anyone can dot anyone, that anyone can provide feedback. He's just coming in with something that you couldn't possibly overwhelm. And then as you point out earlier, he can just say, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? But it's something larger than that. It's, if you're so smart, why aren't you being interviewed all over the world and bragging to Tim Ferriss and Lex Friedman about, about how you've cracked the code to uh, human nature? How did the press do at scrutinizing how Bridgewater was running? I would say at the beginning, it was pretty putrid. A lot of people treated Bridgewater as cute. This approach was just sort of like a wacky off-grid approach. And then Ray does something very smart, I believe, which is he begins to position himself as a, as a thought leader. He leans into the weirdness of it. He says he begins to say things like, this isn't for everyone, or this is like the intellectual Navy SEALs, like the pain is, is a part of the process. Then he begins to spend a tremendous amount of money, frankly, to make sure that that message gets out there. I mentioned Adam Grant, he's one of the most famed organizational psychologists. You know, Adam devotes an entire chapter of his book, Originals, to how great Ray is. And then very shortly after, he goes on the Bridgewater payroll and begins to be paid by Ray Dalio. And he still, to this day, is flogging this, this system. I had to think about that a lot. I do think of Adam as essentially the press at this point, to the extent that he's a popular nonfiction author. He's taken the money, but more than that, he's given up the entire idea that by studying an organization, you should study all sides of it, because he just talks to Ray and to the people that Ray wants him to talk to. I can tell you that as a journalist, and I'm not the only journalist, by the way, who's written true stories about Bridgewater, but you've got to actually make an effort to speak to people at the top, the middle, and the bottom of an organization. And many of these people are justifiably very scared to, to speak. So that said, that's why there's only one nonfiction book about Ray Dalio and Bridgewater, and it's mine. That's why there's not five. <laughs> I was going to mention, I do think that one of the things about who stays is how many people leave, which is there are a lot of people who experience it and walk away. And sometimes they walk away before they are humiliated. In speaking to people about their history there, how are people who have left doing? It's quite the range, to be honest. And it comes back to a principle, because a, a principle at Bridgewater is people have to be willing to humiliate themselves to get at the truth. So when people walk away humiliated, they sort of have to justify it for themselves. They have to say, I brought this upon myself. I knew this would happen. Of course, they didn't know the degree. They didn't know it would be recorded. They didn't know that it would be edited and that they'd be truly you know, maligned. But a lot of people who left are very defensive because people, I'm not supposed to use this term, but I will say, generally speaking, people who leave cults don't say I was in a cult. They say, well, it wasn't that bad for me. And there's a huge range. And I honestly wish that Bridgewater did one thing. I wish that they said to all the current and former employees, you can tell the truth about Bridgewater, positive, negative, neutral. We're not going to make you sign these NDAs. Obviously, you, don't, you can't say our company, quote unquote, secrets, but you can talk about your experience at, at Bridgewater because so many people are terrified to even say the neutral thing, which is to say I was disturbed by part of it, but in other ways, it may have helped my growth. Instead, what they do is over and over again, they pay settlements to people who leave. They threaten people who they think are going to be talking to me. They threaten me, obviously, with the multi-billion dollar lawsuit. It's not the attitude of a place that really is interested in open inquiry into what they're, what they're really like. And one of the recurring themes for people outside of the company or thinking of leaving the company is the fact that the surveillance state inside had collected enough information about them that they would expose. And so, sure, you can talk to the press and I'm going to tell everything on my side about all the recordings we have of you and all of the, the tapes. It was a recurring pattern, but it's also in the book. One young woman leaves. She, she wasn't particularly senior. She wasn't there for a long time. And when her next employer calls Bridgewater for a reference, they say, why the fuck would you want to hire her? Mm -hmm. So even just the, the hard edge of that is enough to scare an employer. And in my personal experience, as you, you mentioned earlier, I actually interviewed for a job there right after college when I didn't have a job that I liked. I interviewed for probably 50 jobs in a month or two. And I think I did one or two screener interviews. And 15 years later, Ray threatens me and says that I've been on a vendetta against the firm. And he says, we'll release the tapes of your interviews. And I said, I hope you do. I'm sure I sound like a real asshole. I knew nothing. <laughs> I think I was interviewing with Dwayne Reed at that point. So that's how they treat 
everyone. They have this surveillance. It's, it is a bit like Scientology in the sense that, you know, at Scientology, you have this e-meter and you're supposed to confess your discomfort and they have all of your secrets. And if you don't open up, then you're not going to be able to ascend to the higher levels of Scientology. At Bridgewater, if you're not able to really confess your weaknesses and the w- things in the world that you're worse at, to be recorded in virtually every moment, you're not going to send to the higher levels of the organization. If I, as a hedge fund, need to show the ultra wealthy that I'm the right place to put their money, and a part of that pitch is performative cruelty to the people who work in the company, is there a market for that story? Is there a paying market for the story that cruelty is necessary for good business? There's a colossal market for it. And it takes only a two degree shift in aperture for me to make that argument for you. Because Ray would say, he'd point to the principle. He would say, at Bridgewater, people are willing to humiliate themselves to get at the truth. So what you outside the firm may see as humiliation was simply our truth seeking. And we will do anything possible to elevate and to discover the truth about investing and about the economy. And so that's why we are so great is because we have an approach that nobody else is willing to do. We are willing to go through it. We're willing to go through this pain for reflection. That's why you should entrust us with our money because we'll do the same thing with your capital, as, as he would say. The, the entire pitch of Bridgewater actually doesn't work without this. And hedge funds writ large are constantly looking for ways to convince investors that they have something like a special sauce in some way. Ray can't tell you what the special sauce of the investing is, if it even exists at all. But what he can tell you is endlessly ad nauseum on every possible media platform and spending millions of dollars in paid advertising that he has a differentiated management approach. And that has been incredibly successful as a marketing pitch. And here's what I worry about. And it's hard to dispel this, actually. It's people in leadership roles will see how successful Bridgewater has been. And we can ask, has it been successful? That's our next question, financially. But it certainly is pitched as being successful and that it's because of the management behavior. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to explore the connection between those two things. First of all, has it been successful as a hedge fund? And then the second question is, is there a connection between that and the management principles? Should they be taking away that message? It was successful for many decades. I'll put it this way. In the early days of Bridgewater, particularly in the 70s, 80s, 90s, it genuinely appeared that Ray had some sort of investment edge. They did tend to make money when other funds didn't. And then it, it had this remarkable quality of not losing money, even in the up years. I don't think it's a coincidence that in the past 15, 20 years, as Ray has made his entire life's animating feature, talking about the principles, that the investing has frankly been putrid. For the last 15 years, the numbers will tell us that compared to other hedge funds, compared to the markets at large, compared to virtually any benchmark, except for you know maybe a hand-picked one that Bridgewater would choose for itself. There's also simple logic here. I'm a finance reporter. So I talk to a lot of successful people and they have many different approaches. But one thing that all of them will tell me is that there's no such thing as a permanent edge in the markets. You have to constantly be working. It's just like, you know, a a technology company wouldn't say our software is great. It's the same thing we've been using for 10 years, constantly investing, you know, trying to stay ahead of the curve. And the idea that Ray and his principles created these immutable investment truths, as he put them, that no one else can discover is, I mean, it's risible to everyone on, on Wall Street. And part of the evidence for that is the performance. Remember a few minutes ago, I mentioned that they hired this IBM scientist, David Ferrucci. David Ferrucci would have been hired by any major investment firm on, on Wall Street. They would have loved to put him to work on using artificial intelligence to uh, research the markets and make more money for their clients. It's only Ray Dalio who would have wasted his time by putting him on figuring out a way to rate his his employees on their personality. And one wonders if Bridgewater's performance would have been better if David Ferrucci were pointed a little closer to the things that mattered. I think there's an argument made in the book that the funds were not managed according to the principles. Well, except in so far as the principles meant Ray makes the decisions. In other words, it was at least implied in the book that the investment team was busy, but not listened to. And that ultimately it came down to Ray's decisions. I think it's more than implied. I'll give you that. It's certainly a a key finding of mine that, and look, the book is primarily not about investing, but that the whole idea that there is this secret behind the scenes mechanism is somewhat of a distraction from the fact that when Ray Dalio wanted to 
have an idea expressed or overrule the system, it invariably could be, which can be of no surprise to anyone who's heard us listening for the past few minutes talking about the management side of the firm. Yeah. So here's the pattern that I see, which is to win investment from the wealthy, you have to make a pitch that you have something special and that's indoors. The pitch is it's the management method. The management method, part of the reason it can't be replicated is because it's nobody would be willing to put up with this otherwise. It's so cruel and so humiliating. But I can hold up that humiliation as an example that shows that we're rigorous and we're serious and it attracts investment, which then is invested without applying the principles. And so the principles really become a marketing tool which looks one way on the outside and doesn't look that way at all on the inside under scrutiny. So to me, those two things are detached. And I guess the next question is, because you're a financial reporter, do you see hedge funds that are as successful or more successful without performative cruelty? Absolutely. There's a very successful hedge fund called Renaissance Technologies. That's essentially a, uh, it's a bunch of computer scientists and nerds. And they give these people a certain amount of money to create algorithms and, and do other research. They say, essentially, we don't even care how it's making money, but figure a, a way to make the tubes connect in a way that you're making a little bit of money. And no one has ever told me a story of anyone at Renaissance who is anything other than a giant dweeb with a profit motive. And this is America. You're permitted to be both of those things. There's more commonly, there are these funds like Citadel and other large, it's founded by this guy, Ken Griffin, who's quite famous now. But what they do essentially is they say to their employees, you're all competing with one another for our money. We have a certain amount of money and we want to give it to our most effective traders. So while it's a highly competitive place, what they're genuinely looking for and what they believe is that by having you compete with one another, the best performers will rise to the top. They'll make the most money. And places like Citadel will fire you very quickly if you're not making the money. But they don't claim it's due to any high-minded philosophical belief. They don't claim that this is a system which is going to hack your brain or improve your ability to have meaningful lives, as Ray puts it. I've never heard Ken Griffin or anyone at Citadel say anything about meaning. I've only heard them talk about creating returns for their clients. This may or may not be a satisfying way for any individual to spend their professional life, but people are allowed to do that. Yeah. The truth is, in the financial industry, there's still this underlying idea that you can predict complex systems and that people who are performing well in those situations are not just rolling the dice better than other people. And so you set up incentive systems that keep people who happen to roll sevens or threes or whatever. It's one of the reasons why tying the management system to performance is very problematic, which is that all financial performance could be luck. In fact, people commonly ask me, there must be some secret sauce to Bridgewater, right? They say like there, there must be some reason why he made money. And I have to say that of the tens of thousands of hedge funds, which might have been started in the 1980s and 90s, math will tell us that one of them is going to flip the coin right 20 times in a row. I'm not saying that I've proven that that's what Bridgewater is, but we would know that that is a guarantee. That firm would then look like a genius. They would then raise more money. They could then become a giant firm. I'm always surprised that a very few investment managers I interview, and I interview a lot, very few of them ever credit luck. Even just the time in which they started their fund. I graduated college in 2009. The markets have been up essentially nonstop since then. If I had started a hedge fund then and had been a hedge fund that bet on rising U.S. stocks, you'd be interviewing me about what a freaking genius I was. And it's very easy for you to believe that, that your performance is because you're a genius and infallible or at least highly believable. It would be believable. I'd have the numbers. The thing that appeals to me more, frankly, is these aphorisms like Silicon Valley companies have don't be evil or don't do evil or whatever. And I would never take that literally. I wouldn't say that just because I think it's a Google one, actually, don't do evil. That means that no evil has ever been done at Google. I doubt Google's founders would say that no one's ever done that. But it is sort of just like an overarching, a one sentence, like if you find yourself at a cross in the road, make sure you're not choosing the evil one is to me a a more sane approach than here are my 400 principles and make sure you're following all of them. And on the point of luck, I think that there's a lot of companies who essentially were right time, right place, who credit their management system, or at least people turn to look at them and say, wow, you're so successful. Your management system must be great. But the truth is, if you're first to market with something really important, that's probably the thing. I uncovered for the book an early version of the principles that Ray has since tried to destroy. 
in which he writes that what is success? Success is nothing more than getting what you want. So in my view, Ray was already successful, but he didn't have what he wanted. He didn't have the adoration of the masses. That's what he really wanted, even more than the money. And so having already been successful on the monetary um, front, he spent the next 20 years making sure that he got what he, what he really wanted, which was to be seen as a philosopher king. Where can people learn more about you and your book? Well, they can pick up the book anywhere. Uh, they can listen to it. They can read the Kindle, it's The Fund, Ray Dalio, Bridgewater Associates, and The Unraveling of a Wall Street Legend. I'm a reporter for The New York Times, so you can always reach me through my Times email. I would also say I have a, I have a website, bridgewaterbook.com. You can sign up for updates, but you might be disappointed. I've written my book on Bridgewater. I'm not sure there's a second one coming. Well, maybe Scientology, as long as you're on a streak. If you haven't read Go and Clear, it's a book on Scientology. There are so many parallels. I would read my book first because it's a, it's a great gift, but then read Go and Clear. It's a wonderful book. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you for just thoroughly researched and clear-eyed looks into a management culture. It was a real harrowing and yet pleasurable to read. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Work for Humans. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with one person you think would get value from it. Believe it or not, this really helps us grow the show and reach more people who want to build the kind of work that people really want. As always, thank you to my producer, Jason Ames at Ninth Path Audio for his insights into content and his high standard for quality. Final note, the opinions shared here are my own and not the views of Google or Cisco Systems. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.